uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start, uh, uh, as one should, and say thank you to the conference organizers for their kind invitation to speak to you about uh, our work with mycoplasmosis disease and our new antibiotic, which has the brand name Avlacin, that's registered worldwide, and the active ingredient, which I hope to tell you a little bit more about this morning, and the Liverpool uh, Infectious Avian Diseases Unit, who did the trial work to enable us to obtain a license. So we'll just move quickly on, and my agenda today is just to introduce you to Eco Animal Health, not least because uh, the United States of America is the last territory in which we will be registering Avlacin as a, a, an antibiotic for use in poultry, uh, both uh, broilers and uh, turkey uh, uh, broilers for red for meat, uh, pigs, and hopefully, uh, before we're all much older, you might have it for game birds too. Uh, a little bit about the UK game bird industry. I'm not an expert in it. There are people in this room from England who are. Uh, the molecule, Tilvelacin uh, tartrate, is the active ingredient, and it's available as a soluble form for game birds and as a premix in uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, just a little bit quickly about eco-animal health. It was started by our chairman, who, having got his chemistry degree from the University College London, decided he wanted to uh, have his own business. So there we go. And then it morphed into Eco Animal Health in 1995, and we're listed on the stock market, which is the wannabe stock market, not the FTSE and the FTSE 100. And we have a, a, a proprietary range of drugs coming through, of which Avlacin is one, and we have a, an extensive generic drug portfolio, which we market in 14 countries worldwide. And as I say, I'm one of the 14 territory managers, and America will be the 14th. So here's Europe. And what's interesting about Europe, and Howard uh, had this, and I had this conversation, um, uh, you can see from the lines of long, long, longitude and latitude where we sit on the globe, and the thing that keeps the British Isles from freezing over uh, is the, the Gulf Stream. And London and uh, Wales, Bettis Hall and Heart of England and High Fly, the three probably largest game farms in the United Kingdom, there are many hundreds of them, uh, is on a latitude with uh, Nova Scotia and New York. And with it comes a few problems, not least that we don't have a climate, we have weather. So welcome to weather hell. <laughs> and you can see here the old man of Britain. And uh, the lighter the, uh, uh, the, the, the gradations on this topographical map is the higher the landscape. And just where the K is is my home in the north of England. And I look after Great Britain for eco. And up on the uplands here, we have the wild grouse. And almost everywhere else in Britain and Ireland, uh, game birds are uh, bred and released for quarry as part of the shooting industry. This is a, a really strange slide. I don't know really why I've got it up, because no one truly knows how many birds there are in the United Kingdom, not least because there's a thing called BFM in the UK with the game keepers, and it's uh, shorthand for bit for me. So the boss says put down 4,000 birds and someone puts down 4,400. Uh, <laughs> you can see the issues it brings. But uh, th there are three or four very large, highly professional uh, shooting, uh, uh, game farms rearing birds for shooting in the UK. And there's about between you know, 250, 300,000 hens caught up in the spring from February onwards. So I would have thought last year, perhaps half a million hens laying eggs for the UK market. Uh, to that, we add the imported eggs, Dale chicks and poults, and uh, I've got 35 million game birds released. That's uh, partridge and pheasant and duck, but it's probably nearer 55 million. It is a very big business. And here are the partridge pens on a, one of the large breeder units in the UK. You can see the sort of terrain. And uh, this is a caught-up hen unit in the north of England, 3,000 hens there. 
And this is typical of a lot of uh, follow-on units for rearing uh, stock, but uh, th this kind of small A-frame, this particular uh, breeder, he gets about three, 400 hens, and uh, they're caught up, of course, and he has a custom hatch and supplies his syndicate shoot, and there are many hundreds of this type of operation in the UK. Okay, so moving on to the active ingredient in the drug Avlacin, we have a name, Tilvalacin tartrate, that's the water-soluble version, and here we have a 2D schematic of the molecule. In reality, it's 3D, of course, and the thing I want to draw your attention to is this hard core in the middle, which is the macrolide ring. And that macrolide, macrolide ring is common to all of the macrolide drug family members. And to use the trade names Thailand, Pulmatil, and uh, Tiamulin or Denegard on the veterinary side, and on the human side, erythromycin and clorithromycin would be too. So almost without question, we've fed our stock with a macrolide, and some of us will have had a macrolide from the GP. The really interesting thing about tilvalacin and why we chose it is twofold. These things, the groups around the core are called the membered rings, and the membered rings, the number of them uh, influences whether a veterinary drug will be veterinary or it will be a human drug. Uh, uh, and uh, we have here the isovaleral group, which actually improves substantially the intracellular penetration of our macrolide. And we have independent work to support that. The second fraction, the se second most important thing, is the 3AT group, which is the first metabolite, and having gone through hepatic recycling through the liver, comes out in the gut, and it is still clinically active. So we're quite excited about the, uh, the, the drug itself, and it's rapidly absorbed, concentrates in the cells, of the phagocytic cells and, and heterophils, as I'll explain in a moment. Primary metabolite is still microbiologically active. And not least, it's palatable. It's the look of the draw. No matter how much money you give your drug discovery team, you can't say, find me a palatable drug. It, you might find a palatable drug, but it may not be efficacious. And uh, the palatability is proving to be a very strong point. Just quickly, uh, you can see here that it was uh, 2008, the European Medicines Agency, which uh, handled everything we do, uh, was, was approved. In 2009, we got the license, minor use, m minimum use in minor species. So we have a drug, finally, that's dedicated for use in pheasants. You can see here uh, the MIC values, minimum inhibitory concentration. That's how little of the drug is needed to inhibit the target organism from developing. There's another subject called MMC, mycoplasmicidal concentration. And in the UK, there are five strains which infect pheasants. Chicken, there are 14. Turkeys, there are 18. A total of 37. And we've examined them all for the MIC. The MIC 90, we need 10 to do that, but there's only five strains at the moment. But you can see that the range that of the activity of the drug is very low to get an MIC, and thus far there's been no resistance recorded. So why is it different? Just quickly, rapid high plasma levels, white cell levels, and high tissue concentration. And the interesting thing is that after about uh, uh, th 15, 30 minutes, one hour, the plasma levels have peaked once the drug is into the bird. And where is it going? Well, it's very simple. With the isovaleral fraction on the molecule, it's going intracellular. And this is really, really important. Now, this work here is not our work. It's by Cambridge University Vet School and the Medical Research Council. So it is independent and verifiable. But along the bottom, you can see the time scale, 15, 30, 60 minutes. And what we do, we take a Petri dish with a, a, a continuous cancer cell line, they know the concentration, and after the time scale, they can measure what's left in the supernatant liquor, and they can deduce what has absorbed into the cell. 
Tilvelacin is the green column, that's the new drug from uh, Avelacin from Eco. Tylacin or, or Tylan is the blue column, and Tilmycosin is the yellow column. And th this intracellular concentration, the speed of it helps to get the resolution to the disease that we get with Avelacin. And this is a slide I like to use uh, in that it looks at the subsystem physiology, the lungs, the air sac, the tracheal lining, the small intestine, and the gut mucosa. And as you know, uh, avians are uh, recirculatory breathers, not bellows breathers, so the lungs are actually quite a small part of the, uh, of the respiratory system, but nonetheless very, very important. But, it, but lung concentration is excellent. We don't see air sacculitis so much in game birds. It's confined to the upper respiratory tract, but it's a big issue in broilers and in turkeys in the UK. Now, the other really interesting thing about avlacin is the way in which it potentiates nonspecific immunity. It actually gives the immune system a boost. And the first line of defense for any uh, blooded species, of course, is... Uh, the white blood cells are neutrophils and heterophils, and it, uh, th these give rise to phagocytic cells, that cells that will destroy an antigen. And the, the avlicin potentiates the monocytes, it's carried into the cells on the late stage monocytes, but it actually potentiates the macrophages not only from resting, but it also activates more macrophages. And here's a macrophage, it's classically known as the hunter. And this metataxic probe here is locked on to the organism. In this case, it was uh, mycoplasma. And then it will slowly work its way down and, with enzymic action, destroy it. Just to demonstrate this, this is some in vivo work we did with chicken lung. And you can see the difference in the gray splodges. These are actually macrophages. And there's no... Avelacin given to these birds before they sacrifice and harvest the lung. And on this one, the lung for the chicken, 20 milligrams only, you can see the concentration of the macrophages. And there's no question, birds look really well on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on Avelacin and the drug. So the question is, does it work? To cut to the chase, does it work in turkeys, uh, not in turkeys, pheasants? Yes, it does. And what I'd like to do now is just quickly uh, go through the uh, trial work conducted by Professor Bradbury and her team at the uh, Avian Infectious Diseases Unit at Liverpool Veterinary School over in England. Now, here we have the little blighter. I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but this is a macrophage. It's not a macrophage. It's a, uh, a mycoplasma cell. And this is a, a, an electron micrograph of the trachea. And this is what's happening, and this is why the problem is so difficult to be deal with historically. Each of these large bodies is a single cell, and these fronds are the cilia, and the cilia are the mechanism, a bit like an escalator. With the mucus, it moves up all the crud that we ingest, both in humans and in birds. So dust, bacteria, viruses, fungi, cigarette ash, Th their job is to move up all the crud on the mucus wall system and out. This mycoplasma, smaller than a bacteria, larger than a virus, you can see what it's done, the clever little thing, using chemical messengers, it's actually destroyed the cilia and it's about to enter the cell and destroy that. And that's what we're out to kill. Uh, this is how we see mycoplasmosis in birds in the UK. Classic uh, problems with the, the nares and the, uh, the, the infraorbital sinuses fill up with mucous membrane. We get sneaking, coughing, and we want them to look healthy and fit. Liverpool University have been conducting mycoplasma work along with some workers here in America that were with the chucker partridge, we were the first to realize the two groups of workers in the US and Liverpool that mycoplasma was causing an infection on its own. Liverpool University developed an experimental challenge model. And when you're licensing drugs in today's world, challenge models rule. 
We conducted the uh, studies <coughs> with Ableson subject to Home Office approval regarding welfare and all that was necessary to prove our point. The organism here is Mycoplasma galaseptica infection in pheasants. And the work here was done by uh, uh, Forrester, Davis and Bradbury. It was the, the Game and Wildlife Conservancy Trust and the National Gamekeeper sponsored this work. But over the years, they've determined that there are the five mycoplasma strains that will, in and of themselves, cause a disease in game birds. Interestingly, in England, there's one turkey strain too. And you can see that each of the strains causes a different level and type of infection. As a result of this work, they chose G87, which is the most ubiquitous type and the one thing that comes up most on diagnostics in the UK, along with others. But G87 was chosen to be the challenge model because this was the most pathogenic. This is the isolation unit, a part of it here. It's Dr. Anne Forrester. And one of the problems we had with the trial, because there was no antibiotic, for game birds, there's no previous model, and uh, <coughs> the Home Office inspector refused to grant an animal test certificate because he wasn't satisfied Liverpool could keep the three groups of animals separate. The control birds, the birds to be challenged and not treated, and the third group which were to receive the new uh, antibiotic. But they, they ran the work, and whilst they were running the work to satisfy the Home, of inspe home Office inspector, we ran some dose titration studies as well. So we, we measured four different doses and we selected 25 milligrams per kilogram. And uh, in the, certainly in Europe, uh, PPM and kilos per tonne or pounds per tonne is going out and increasingly they're insisting on a milligram per kilogram dose for all target animals treated. And uh, the poultry studies that we'd done with a full license enabled us to carry forward and ask for a mum's license, minimum use, minor species. Trial design, we'd had 84 pheasants, Chinese cross ring necks, three pens of 12 were medicated, three pens of 12 were unmedicated, and one pen of 12 was left as a no challenge unmedicated control. And the organism, as I mentioned earlier, was Mycoplasma galaseptica,m and this was uh, inoculated intranasally to the chicks or the young poults at 14 days of age. Now, the clinical signs to be evaluated, and uh, Bill and a couple of other people and I have got to have this discussion about mycoplasmosis in the North Americas, but watery eyes, conjunctivitis, depression, reluctance to move and ruffle feathers, nasal exudate, sinus swelling, and this is, was graded, mild, moderate, or marked, and the respiratory signs, sneezing, snicking, and gasping, were again graded, mild, moderate, and substantial. And I'd like you to try to remember these codes, W, C, D, N, S, R, because when we look at the next slide or two, th these are the untreated pheasants that were challenged, and this is 26 days post-infection. You can see clearly all the classic symptoms of mycoplasmosis. Thankfully, because Liverpool proved to the Home Office inspector they could run the study without any cross-infection, all the controls stayed bright as a button and healthy. Lesion scoring, to give you a clue, this is a lesion score of three, the worst possible. And here we see... <coughs> the response to the medicine. And the red series and the blue series, the red series are the unmedicated group, the blue series is the treated group. And of course, they were treated on day zero of the trial, day one. And then uh, the clinical signs were measured in the mildest form here, the most severe form at the top. And you can see that uh, they started treating when a certain percentage of the birds were showing signs of illness, and that's the premise of a challenge study in Europe. And uh, we, we, you can see there's quite a large uh, reduction in the clinical symptoms, and a quick reduction too. Now, I wouldn't normally show a, a, an audience 
the raw data from the trials, but each of these squares represents a bird. Pen 4, pen 5, pen 6. This is the birds that were challenged with the disease and then left unmedicated. Where there's a blank, a dot, of course there's no bird, it's expired or been euthanized. And each of these, actually, lacrimation, depression, conjunctivitis, the severity, you can see, I know it's a poor slide, but it just illustrates the next one much more easily, you can see that they've got the different scores for the different clinical symptoms, and those are the birds that were challenged with the disease mycoplasma, contracted mycoplasmosis, and then left untreated. Here's the signs again, just to remind us, and here's the birds that were treated with avlicin post-infection. And there's no question, it's a very fast drug, it's a very effective drug, and although they're still showing signs here, uh, clinical symptoms, if you remember the scoring, the lower the number, the milder the clinical symptom, uh, these were subjective scores, and it, it was just really the nasal exudate that was showing and a few other things. But the birds were very much improved. To summarize the main clinical findings, we have to look at the measure the unmedicated group, the treated group, and the statistical significance. And you can see here that uh, we've got uh, uh, watery eyes, large percentage in the unmedicated group, low percentage here, conjunctivitis, large percentage, ablesin, no conjunctivitis, nasal exudate, which was showing on the trial score sheet before, and depression, no, no depression, sinus swelling low. And the most important thing is the statistical significance. The lower the number, the more likely what has happened is a direct result of your actions. And uh, these, these show a really uh, helpful statistical significance. Not, not satisfied that uh, we'd re resolve the disease, we had to check that the disease was manifest in both groups of birds that were challenged. And we use polymerized chain reaction, genetic fingerprinting, which is widely used in diagnostics, as you know. I, this is from the eye, the eye isolation, the sinus, uh, PCR, polymerized chain reaction. And you can see again that we've got recovery, so we knew the birds were suffering from the disease they'd been challenged with. And again, results, the p-value, the probability, very low, highly probable. We've got a result. And this is a slide which is often overlooked when we're discussing ablesin in, uh, uh, in game birds in, in the UK and in Europe. And this is the weight gains. And, and this is something which disease does manifest itself as economic loss, falling way behind. And if we look again here, statistical significance, a p-value of 0, 0, 0, 0002, that's excellent. So in conclusion, we're satisfied that tilvelacin, the antibiotic in our brand name product, Ablacin, has shown to be highly effective in the treatment of mycoplasmosis. The Committee on Veterinary Medicines panel uh, gave a positive opinion in 2009. Uh, EU Commission approval, it's pan-European uh, uh, authorization, December 2009, and we introduced to the UK and European market 2010, and the first season of full season of prescriptions was 2011. Acknowledgements, Dr. Anne Forrester, it was actually part of her PhD, was this work, uh, Professor Janet Bradbury, Cynthia Dare, the technician, all at the University of Liverpool, veterinary pathology, Professor Ricky Demang, who's Professor of Statistics at, a, is it VA's Virginia, is it? I can't remember the codes for the US states, but he's our consultant on statistics worldwide. Helena Windsor at Mycoplasma Experience. Those of you have any experience of researching mycoplasma, you know it's an absolute monkey to move around and recover, uh, but they are one of the world's uh, leading places. And then John Tasker and Dr. Mockett at Eco Animal Health. And I think that brings me to the end of the presentation.